Hello and welcome to USC's Roski Lunch with Creatives. Thank you for taking your lunch hour to join us here today. I'm Haven Lynn Kirk, the Dean of the USC Roski School of Art and Design. And it's lovely to have everyone, everyone here. Uh, just a quick kind of an overview. Hi. Um, uh, for today's talk, um, I'm gonna first introduce our faculty host and she will introduce the guest. And then at the close of the, um, the talk, we'll give you enough time to ask questions or if there's some comments that, um, that you have for either Suzanne or Megan, um, feel free to either raise your hand and then um, share your screen so we can see your face, right? Um, and ask, or you can also post it in the chat and um, Jean Lee is uh, moderating for us. And so she may uh, also prompt you so that way we don't have people talking over one another and um, indulge us in this Zoom environment. So, all right, so um, before we begin, here's a brief background about the series. Uh, Lunch with Creative was designed as a conversational creative pause, highlighting unscripted talks around timely topics pertaining to the field of art and design. This year's series will be expanded to include hosts from our faculty and their guests from the creative fields that have diverse and unusual um, careers or trajectories. The conversations um, that are held are in a much more intimate forum to allow for audience participation and the talks should spark interest and give perspective to what's happening in our, in our communities. So let's get started. Um, let me introduce today's host, our very own Suzanne Lacey. Suzanne is a professor here at, of art at Brosky. She's an internationally exhibited visual artist, social activist, an educator, a writer, and feminists whose body of work includes performance, video and photographic installation, critical writing and public art. Her work often focuses on social and urban issues and she's exhibited far and wide. And so we're, we're so pleased to have her here today. And she will be hosting today's talk with her special guest, Megan Steinman. And so I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne so she can make the introductions, all right. Thank you, Haven, appreciate it. Uh, and I leapt at it when Haven asked me if I wanted to do her Lunch with Creatives project because I have a lot of good friends that I've met through USC and um, who have gone through the programs there even long before I was involved with it. I'm super excited to have my dear friend Megan Steinman uh, speaking with us today and um, we were talking about my international exhibitions. Uh, they have included Megan as a curator uh, for a project in Italy and a project here in Los Angeles, very big projects. But Megan is, um, uh, I don't wanna go through, we're not, we're not in, in this talk, I think we're not gonna go through a kind of a typical, um, what are her professional accomplishments? I really wanna focus because her, her professional accomplishments are, are wide. I want to focus on um, what it means to live a reflective life, what it means to be an ethical artist or curator or designer. How do you basically form yourself as a person and as a professional? And I know that Megan is uh, the perfect person to, to have this conversation. So um, I'll start with um, that between 2015 and 2020, as you probably all know, she uh, worked at the Underground Museum as the director and um, is, uh, has many, many other talents. And I want to, this first section of the conversation, Megan, I would love it if you would start with us the kind of journey of your life, the trajectory of starting in the Bay Area, uh, very fertile place to be a young person, I think. Um, how, how did you find yourself from a young person in the Bay Area all the way to USC's graduate program. What was that, briefly, what was that journey? Uh, long and twisted. Uh, <laughs> uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for inviting me, Suzanne. Um, um, anyway, we've known each other for decades now, so I'm always super happy to just get together with you for lunch, period. So sorry, it has to be on Zoom now. Haven and Jean, thank you. Um, I left for New York from the Bay Area uh, when I was 18 years old. And I, um, I did so um, as I've kind of done most of my geographical hopping with just this like, 
instinct that there was something to be discovered in another part of the world. Um, growing up in the Bay Area was fantastic. Um, you know, I'm the child of two transplants uh, from the East Coast to hippies. And I always kind of say my generation, uh, your parents were either hippies or Panthers. And so if you can think about that's like the political yeah. environment upon which I was in the Bay Area. That's yeah, exactly. 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 And I and point out that Megan's mother is somebody I've worked with a lot. And Megan comes from a family of super professional artists, in fact. Yeah, yeah. So uh, following that, the, uh, that impetus, that DNA took me to New York. And I actually didn't have a plan to be in the arts. I, I wanted to just be in, in New York City writ large. And I ended up getting a job um, at a record label, Jive Records, which at the time was home to Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys, but also Tribe Called Quest and E-40. And like, it was just a really incredible time to be uh, in the record business. It was the late 90s, which I don't know if any of you all remember, but I worked in the music video production department. And this was the time of like the million dollar video where there was, you know, champagne and cash, not real by the way, uh, being like thrown over every single screen. And uh, it, was a, it was a good time. It was, I did my twenties in New York. So it was a good time to be there. And after uh, I was at Jive Records, I was asked by uh, Annie Leibovitz, who's actually my aunt to come and work with her on her project that she was creating, which was American Music, one of her uh, collections of photography. And she asked me to come on as her her chief researcher and producer for the book. And I, she told me with this is, I got a little bit duped by the project because she did tell me that it was gonna be really quick. It was gonna be like a year long project. We were gonna get in and get out and do the work. And I walked in to her studio that was in Chelsea at the time. And I looked at kind of like what they had produced so far in order to prepare for this book. And it was literally, you guys, two manila folders. One said Johnny Cash and the other one said Roseanne Cash. I'm like, that that's all y'all have done on like, making this book. So uh, it was amazing because I basically got to create this body of work with her from scratch and it was all geographic based. We traveled to what I identified as the music centers of the country, uh, Nashville and Memphis, Detroit, uh, Mississippi, we went down the Blues Highway. And what I also did at that time was got in touch with, um, you know, every single local person working in their own community's music center. I was really trying to get away from, uh, you know, the accolades and the Grammys, like none of that mattered. What mattered was how was that particular geography creating the art that was coming out of it and getting to know like local writers and radio hosts, et cetera. And they would all give me names, like who are the top 10 musicians that I should be in contact with? And then they would give me 10 names and somebody else would give me 10 names. And pretty soon you see that the same names are popping up. And that's how I got to meet you know, blues legends like Otha Turner and Arl Burnside and Juan Atkins and Derek May in Detroit, you know, the, you know, uh, creators of house music and techno music and really like these people that um, have now been, of course, you know, put through the history books, but then were relatively unknown or not known enough, right? Um, and after working on um, that book, which was incredibly, um, prolific for me to just understand also how to discover um, space and how to discover uh, art centers, you know, and, and what's already happening there. I moved myself out to California, to Los Angeles, and I actually ended up going back into the music business and I became the creative director at Capitol Records. Uh, and, you know, I should say stepping back into that, that world was, um, it wasn't, you know, too off-putting only because obviously working for Annie is not is not a small time job, but what Capital actually showed me and to the point of like having a reflective life is, is actually what I don't want to be a part of, which is the corporatization of art, right? And the kind of evacuation of the creative process in the name of volume and profit, which just became immediately um, apparent that that was going to be the thing that dictated all of the creative work that I wanted to put forth um, with the musicians. Is that what uh, motivated you to go to grad school? I remember we, we met in Berlin, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. When you were- Yeah, so I, 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 well, 
you know oh, no, that was later that was later. Well, well, real talk, and, and I, I will be very candid about this. So basically what happens when you're working for big corporations is that you are at the mercy of all of their mergers and, you know, their moves. And so Capital merged with uh, Virgin Music, and they basically labeled every single employee in Capital Records redundant. I mean, it was incredible. I was leading my department and I was sitting there in negotiations trying to figure out how to get people the most amount of money that they could on their way out the door. They literally just shut down an entire building of workers and got rid of them. So I moved to Berlin. I needed to like clear my palette, get myself back uh, into focus on, um, on art, you know, and creativity. And that's when I decided to go to graduate school because at that time, it really was um, fundamental to have a, uh, a master's degree in uh, art history and or curating in order to work in institutions. That's definitely loosened up a bit more now. Um, but also I, I realized that there was a lot that I didn't know you know, that there was a lot of connective tissue between historical art movements that I wanted to understand in order to form the kind of exhibitions that I wanted to create. And so I moved back to California, went to graduate school at USC, uh, got an M, it's, it was then called an MPAS, a Master of Public Art Studies. And I actually, I chose USC specifically for that program because, you know, I believe that curating and this idea of the activity of thinking through art and working with artists is something that is um, uh, instinctive in many ways and not something that necessarily needs the learning, but I was actually super interested in what else art can make possible. And so the public aspect of it was absolutely where I wanted to root my studies because I wanted to think about the conversations. I wanted to think about where else art could be produced outside of institutions, you know, coming out of the experience of working in this big conglomerate. I wanted to understand how that we can actually get back to the more um, localized and focused conversations with our cities and our communities around art. And so it was a great program for that. And, and we looked at essentially every single um, art historical movement of the 20th and 21st century through the lens of publicness. One of the things that um, that we talked about the other day was you, you were talking about how you form your life as a professional. Yeah. The place you're in. Yeah. And the who you want to be sort of come together. And I want to take us to um, how this personal political <clears throat> and public, you know, your, your interest in the public, your interest in political issues came together um, a few years later when you began to work at the, uh, you were invited to help form the Underground Museum. Yeah, I mean, the Underground Museum absolutely is the, I always say, is the perfect synthesis of my inclinations around art offering into the world, right? Um, the mission, if you guys don't know, is very succinctly to make sure the maximum number of people have access to contemporary art, period. Uh, and it's done so from the understanding and from the position of a group of artists that didn't have access, right? And so instead of trying to work their way out, you know, around and up and through the existing institutions, uh, Noah Davis and Karan Davis, the founders of the museum, along with Noah's brother, Khalil Joseph, and his partner, Anya Anyamu, decided to create their own. And I stepped into the fold um, through my work with Helen Molesworth, who was then the chief curator at MOCA. And we were able to, together as a group, A, think about the kind of institution that we wanted to build. So the politics and the thinking about, you know, the reflectiveness of who we are at, in our workspaces and who we wanna be and how we wanna grow this museum, is in the building of the museum itself. How do we think about a museum that is incredibly people-centric, that understands holistically the humans that are working there and what they need? Um, and then also, how do we think about who we are in relationship with every single person that walks through the door? And how do we create a really responsive environment that addresses um, people's lives so that the museum itself can be this one entity that is 
uh, part and parcel and, you know, flowing through the ecosystems of people's lives. And so I think like that, that kind of idea about politics, you know, all of, we always like lean into politics as this thing of, you know, elections or, you know, elected officials or, you know, um, systems. But I think where the politics at the underground museum lies is really in the relationships of um, of people, you know, and, and those relationships are then the movements and structures and the new systems that we build together. And that's the kind of politics that we're building at the underground. Interesting. What was interesting to me is everybody uh, on outside looking in uh, was very curious about you as a white woman being invited to produce, um, uh, to, to basically expand and develop a program that really was known for its racial uh, focus and focus on uh, mostly black, but all kinds of artists of color. And I'm I'm curious to how obviously for over five years you've navigated that quite well. And I'm curious about how you answered that. And I, I know many of our audience will be interested, given the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, how do you navigate as a, a white woman in a sensitive way within institutions that are trying to prioritize? Uh, racial and other kinds of equity issues. Yeah, I I appreciate that question so much. I mean, first and foremost, to to just clarify for one piece because it's really important to the museum is that the underground museum is proudly black owned and black family owned, but it shows and it shows artists of all colors, and that is really important because the idea is around context creation and storytelling and how artists of color historically have been marginalized by the long arc of our history. And so if we want to adjust that arc, right, or I should say like reveal that the arc is not a clear narrative, we've got to actually continue to um, put everyone at the table together, you know, and that's what's happening at the Underground Museum, period, right? Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this the other day. I don't have a way like that I specifically navigated it. I have a way that I understood my place in the world period, which is first and foremost, that we are all operating, I believe, we are all operating under systems of oppression, right? That white supremacy is an oppressive system that we are all participating in and we all are oppressed by it in the sense that it is, hovering over us. It, it, it involves the systems that are our government, our schools, you know, our, and our museums. And so there's no way that me stepping into a black owned museum that we are going to be absolved of those same systems, right? That they're all there. And so that I am in some ways representative of the privilege and the system itself. And so every single person that I would come into contact with who was either another white person or a person of color that was distrusting of my place there, you know, A, I'm not taking it personally because I know where it's coming from, right? And I know that I'm actually participating in that same system all the time and that system is there. And B, that, you know, I can't actually undo however many X years that whoever the person is questioning my space uh, that I'm taking up there, um, that they have experienced pain and distrust and disadvantage elsewhere in their life. Like, I'm not gonna undo that. So all I can do is just be really sensitive to the actual of the you know, conditions that we are all participating in. So that's kind of the part one of it, right? Mm -hmm. And then the part two is to, from that position of sensitivity and from that position of just honestly, right? And just like really keeping it real of, of how this all, all works and, and, and how we're, you know, structuring our lives is to then be a conscious participant. So that means actually sometimes not being in the room. And that means removing yourself from the room if it means that the energy that is necessary for the room um, requires no white people in it, you know? And how can you also um, provide um, the space and the structure for that room to exist and not be in it and not have your ego so involved that you also need to be there front and center all the time. Like in my opinion, it was like much more important to forward the mission of the museum. Like I am working in service of the mission of the museum period. And so how I navigated it was always with that in mind of just 
uh, what is my role at this moment? What is my relationship at this moment? What is my space um, that I'm occupying at this moment? And how do I push and pull and navigate that in a constant um, um, evolutionary kind of way, right? It's never the same thing any day. Let's dig a little deeper into that because I think that is really important for people to hear is your part one, don't take it personally. Yeah. And what that means is your personal experience, and I'm sure you got some of this from growing up in the Bay Area, where the discourse on race is certainly more um, out there, out front than it is in many parts of our country. Yeah. Or it was at that time. But I think that, that don't take it personally at the same time as you're fitting yourself into a big picture historical perspective. And I think those two cues are something that could serve all of us to explore uh, a little bit. How, how does your personal, don't take it personally, fit into this, this larger context? And that really seems to me the way you navigate. Yeah, I think it comes from this understanding of who I am as an individual and who I am as a community member, right? And, and to be in community, to be in fellowship, right? To be taking up uh, for how we all move through this world together, right? Means that sometimes you're actually uh, absolving the individuality and you're kind of absolving the, um, you know, the what I need and the who I am, right? And the recognition that I need, like that's, you know, the word we always comes to mind, the word us always comes to mind, you know, it, it, it's almost like I'd love for us to use those words more than we use words like community because I feel like we are part of the us, we are part of the we in a much more, um, you know, concentrated way and like understandable way. Um, I, ha I had like a little antidote that, you know, if you'll indulge me for a second on, I'm, I'm a huge Octavia Butler fan. I don't know if there's any Octavia Butler fans in the mix here, um, but in her book, Kindred, and I hope I'm not spoiling it for anybody, but in her book, Kindred, a black woman living in 1972 gets thrown back into antebellum uh, slavery in the uh, 19th century. In 1972, her husband is white, right? And in 1972, when she and her husband get married, her family as a black woman and half a black family is livid. How could she possibly do this, right? And what Octavia Butler does so beautifully is she takes you back to a time where you understand the construction of that anger and you understand the construction of that distrust and, you, and she brings it all with you into the present day so that you understand incredibly clearly why a black family in 1972 would not be okay with their very liberal niece having relationships with a white man, period, right? And so I just think that uh, we are all products of history. I am a product of history. I'm a product of like the time traveling that my DNA has done in order to get me into this one particular moment. And so, that that time traveling also includes all of the people and places and relationships that came before me in order for me to get to this place. So I guess that's how I can navigate spatially and cosmically and theoretically and, and, and personally, like how I am in the world right now and where I am in the world right now. And understanding that I, as like the individual, am also surrounded constantly by this swirling we yeah. and us. And that's you know, how I can talk there. I think that's such a great son of kind of consolidation, the uh, Octavia Butler, um, you know, I, idea of that, that would be so helpful today. When you hear people, um, uh, you know, I come from a working class white family, and when you hear people in that community of Central Valley um, saying, "Well, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter is all very well and good, but uh, I'm not oppressing black people," and you know, they absolutely have no sense of the way today's act is linked historically over time. And I think that's that's really, really great. I'm wondering I, if you could explore, yeah, I'm wondering if you could explore for a minute how we move from here into your leaving underground museum. So uh, in June, um, 
I was participating in all of the protests that were going on. And, you know, I think that this past year, if, if you're not reflecting and not living a reflective life amidst what we have all just experienced over the last year, um, take some time off, get off of Zoom and go start reflecting. Um, but I was doing all of that and I, was just, again, thinking about my place within the larger context of the community that I am a part of and that I have been part of for the last five years at the underground. And, and again, like what is my particular, um, my role and, and, and what space am I holding in that community, in, in my community? And, um, and I just really came to the very clear decision that in this particular moment with where museums are looking to go, that the Underground Museum could be and should be and will hopefully remain to be a leader in what it looks like to have black leadership across the board. And so I wanted to remove myself from that equation so that the Underground Museum could forward itself with black leadership into the future. But I did so, and I think that this is really important, um, in a way that absolutely considered the museum. Like I've always thought about the museum as this kind of cosmic being that we are all stewards of and that we are all tasked with caring for together. And my leaving was done with that exact same care, right? I made sure that I should say we made sure that it was an incredibly profound process to do this over the last um, six months with the entire museum staff and, and wonderful consultants. But we made sure that the museum is set up for success. It is in its best financial standing. Uh, employees have been promoted. You know, folks are excited about where it's going in the future. And, and, you know, again, this is the way that you take the individual out of the equation and you really think to how do we work together in order to get the same outcome that we are all striving for anyway. Um, and so, yeah, I, I have to say the leaving process was done in such an us way, you know, with so much love and so much care and so much honesty. You know, I would sit in meetings with my board and everybody would kind of be like, this is weird. It's very transparent. We've never done this before. <laughs> and just, you know, we just, you know, rolled with it. And we're just always from start to finish open about how everybody was feeling throughout the process, what everybody else's visions for the museum were really starting to incorporate all of the voices from top to bottom of how we together were going to bring the museum forward. Um, and you mentioned, an you mentioned an anecdote, which was, or maybe it was, maybe it was just an observation that was important to you, yeah. that the, the young people, the volunteers, the young people, the staff, yeah. it was important for those young people to have leadership that was not white leadership at a certain moment in time. Can you explore that a little bit with me? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I to, to let yourself make yourself redundant. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, again, it was, it was all of the, the activity that was happening in June and over, over the course of the summer. And I was really thinking about in reverence, how if we think about most of the major political movements of our time, that they're led by young people, right? They're led by young people who are tired of the, you know, status quo and want real change and are taking it into their own hands in order to create it. And so I thought about all the young people that were working at the Underground Museum and what it might feel like, you know, in this particular moment with all the action being led by people their age to uh, work at a black owned museum and report to a white woman. And to be super honest, the, the math just did not add up for me. Um, you know, I think ultimately I was a bit um, surprised by uh, when I did tell the staff the reaction, you know, it, we obviously are an incredibly tight knit family at the underground museum. And so, you know, I don't, I, I think that um, it was a much more emotional departure than I had anticipated and a much more emotional detachment that I, um, than I had anticipated. Um, but I remain incredibly committed to, um, you know, 
So people I'm, in general, like the people that I, the people that worked for us at the Underground Museum, it, it's again, it's it's not about um, it's not about uh, trying to like formulate this like structure and like specific way to uh, navigate, you know, them and me. It's more like who is Justin and Veronica and Brandon and Malia and how do and Zuri and how do I stay in relationship with them? Right. And so at that time, I felt that the best relationship for myself and for them was for them to um, have black leadership at the museum. Because, you know, here's the other thing is that um, representation matters. And if you don't see it in your life all the time, then you don't have examples that you can be it. And so that's just really important. So, you know, um, this brings up um, what happens next in your life and We've also talked about risks, and uh, I believe you left the Underground Museum with no job prospect <laughs> on the horizon, and you support yourself. So, um, so first tell me about risk, and okay. the risk, and then tell me about what you're up to. Uh, okay, what well, can I tell you about risk? Um, I probably take less, I mean, this was a risky moment, but uh, I probably take, uh, more risks than I should. Uh, if you were to ask my family, they might agree with me on that one. Um, but I don't know, you know, my decision to leave the Underground Museum, let's just say this, my decision to leave the Underground Museum had absolutely to do with understanding how my personal trajectory meets with the trajectory of the world, right? And those two things just really synced up. And it didn't feel like a risk at the time. Like, I don't think when I'm taking these risks that they, that I am thinking about them in risk factor, I'm more thinking about them in opportunity moments, right? Um, what needs to happen in order for me to grow? Do I need to move to New York in order for me to grow? Do I need to move to Berlin in order for me to grow? Do I need to move to LA in order for me to grow? Do I need to move myself physically out of a particular role in order for myself to grow and for the museum to grow? It's like really thinking about what is the uh, potential for, you know, how I wanna live my life and what I wanna learn and, and, and where I wanna you know, direct my, my focus. That's, I think I'm looking at a little bit more than, than risk. Right. Um, I definitely did have a thought, um, you know, Megan, are you really unemploying yourself in the middle of a pandemic? You know, I, that definitely crossed my mind. Um, and I, I did because I actually also am a firm believer that when one is going towards the opportunity that is instinctively who they are, um, it's going to be okay you know, something is going to happen. And, and that's not necessarily a one for one in the term, in the sense, like, it's not that tomorrow, everything is going to like magically wrap itself up with a bow. But I believe that, um, that things will work out and I will find my new place. And actually, you know, to be super honest, what this time is now allowing me to do is to really hone in on what the next step looks like. What is the kind of institution that I want to be aligned with? Where is work needed? How can we grow as a field together, right? Who are the people that I want to be in partnership and relationship and collaborate with because they are also on the same trajectory and believe the same things that I believe to be true about what the field needs and how the field can grow. Uh, and, and I'm looking for that landing pad where all those things kind of coalesce. And now I remember I caught you at one point before Underground Museum and and quickly asked you to produce a couple of projects with me. Yeah. And I felt even at the time that was a risk for you. Somebody coming from, uh, you know, you teach, you curate shows, you're curating something at LAX, you're highly professional. And I thought, wow, I've managed to grab her at this moment in time uh, when she's got a little space. And I felt like it was a risk for you to actually take on those shows uh, with me. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I do think risk is important and I do think your courage and your reflection is, is important um, to your development as a person, to your life journey and, and to who you are professionally. I, I'm curious about what you're thinking of in terms of what's next. What kind of thing now? I mean, I tried to get you to come to work with me in Oslo, right? 
So I tried it again, but I think now your your concept of where you want to go is, uh, you know, maybe even more developed. And I'm curious to hear what that is. Uh, I have I have lots of thoughts. You know, one of the things that I'm I'm uh, visioning deeply. Um, as far as institution building and as far as the kind of institution that I would like to work with, if that institution already exists, is um, this concept of how would an institution behave if it were a citizen of its city, right? That really thinking deeply about how the institution is in relationship to its location and the responsibility and the accountability that comes behind being a citizen, right? Like if you think about all of our jobs as citizens of our cities, like we have work to do, you know, in addition, we have to participate hopefully in councils, we have to know our neighbors, we have to vote, we have to uh, keep the city clean, you know what I mean? We and safe and we have to look out for our children, et cetera. Like there's a lot of work that goes into being a citizen. And what would that mean if the institution considered itself that way? You know, the other thing Thing that I'm completely committed to and that we did so well at the Underground Museum and I'm so proud of, of that kind of work which is to how to create belonging inside a museum and I want for um, everybody to feel that they have a sense of belonging. You know one of the things and I'm not sure that um, you and I were talking about it or not before Suzanne but I, I realized that you know most museums are constructed with this idea around protection of the art, you know, and, and, and like, how do we create barriers and how do we create systems that like protect the art, but protect it from who? Protect it from us, the people that are coming into, you know, and how, and whether we're like uh, processing that consciously or subconsciously, it has to kind of land and infiltrate our thinking of, um, you know, that we are somehow needing protection from, right? And so how can we actually think about creating spaces where it's not about protection, it's about belonging and it's about welcoming and it's about putting objects and people and ideas in deep relationship with one another. And so that's that's what I'm looking for. And that looks, and as far as like a specific role, it looks like a lot of things. It looks like teaching. I teach at MICA in Baltimore. It looks like uh, directing a different kind of museum. It looks like working in education and context building and engagement. It looks like social impact. It looks like politics. It looks like a lot of things. Does that mean you're gonna run for mayor? <laughs> no, I have other USC alumni that I'm hoping runs for mayor. Really? <laughs> I was all, I, I mean, I'll just put it out there. I personally think that if Patrice Colors was our mayor of Los Angeles, we would be, we would be working business. <laughs> Maybe I can like start that rumor mill here. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Patrice Colors is a graduate of, uh, well, most primarily she's a, a co-founder of Black Lives Matter and now the, I think the executive director, I'm not sure exactly what the title is, but. Uh, yeah. But she's also a graduate, a proud graduate of our MFA program at Roski and a good friend of all of ours. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, given your interest in construction and your kind of utopian vision of what an institution can be. And I think given the risks that you're willing to take and probably don't even think much about it, I, I would consider you one of those rare breeds of startup people and I know for myself, having um, uh, started several things, startup people tend to um, get very bored very quickly with the way things are. And they kind of want to go and construct the way things could be. And I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of institution uh, you'll, you'll next be part of. Yeah, I am too. I mean, I'm, you know, in lots of lots of talks at the moment, and it ranges from startups uh, to uh, large legacy institutions. And, you know, I can't see you at MoMA, Megan. No? Well, I could see you at MoMA, but I can't see you dealing with 
the level of bureaucratization that's, that's yeah i mean here's like here's like if and maybe this is uh utopic in thinking but here's what i hope um for you know our field but also for institutions writ large education political systems etc you know it's just this like deep understanding that the way that the system is currently constructed was created by a group of people right, who decided that the system was going to be a particular way at a particular time, and it has now just played itself out, right, and what we collectively, I hope, can work together on, whether it's at MoMA or startups, is the understanding that we can be the next group of people that start to reimagine how these systems are operating for and by us, and I really believe that um, that's long work. So it's not, again, the, and that's, I guess, where the utopic meets the road, which is that, you know, that doesn't mean that I start at MoMA and all of a sudden MoMA is changed and like it's a whole new kind of bureaucracy. But what I hope it means, and I guess this is actually a learning, I'm just actually thinking about this in real time now, what I hope from my time at Capital, like what would it have meant to go into Capital and not have been such like an a knee jerk, oh my God, I have to escape this large conglomerate, but oh, how can I start to make micro moves, right? How can I start to rebuild from the inside and start to bring in other employees and other systems that start to kind of, you know, again, from like the insides of the organism start to reshape and reform and send it in potentially new directions that might not actually be seen at my time while I'm working there, but might be effects that are lasting and permanent later on down the road for other people. You've definitely got more patience than I do. <laughs> but, but I want to do a, a, an audience check now because we like to move into allowing people to speak. And I'm curious uh, if you would flip your... Um, flip your uh, video cameras on if you are interested in participating in a conversation, that would be really great. Um, unless this is your lunchtime break and you're actually having your sandwich and using- We're, we're, in, we're in Zoom land, eating is absolutely available. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was lunch with creatives. So yeah. for, those, for those of you that are interested in this kind of conversation I'm um, with Megan, I'm curious to uh, Reed, you need to hop on wherever you are. Are you there? Where's Reed? One of our <laughs> yay. Uh, okay. So, um, so you know what? What kinds of issues she's raised? She's covered a tremendous amount of territory. What kinds of issues has she raised that, in fact, might be of interest to you? How many of you are students now in school? N nobody. Okay, so you, you're you all in your professional role in some way or other, is that right? There were two hands in their students, Suzanne. I see, I don't, I don't see all of them, so okay. Um, so we've got a couple of students and we've got other people who are already out and in, in their uh, respective institutions or job positions, is that accurate? Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think there's two really kind of key issues here that Megan's brought up. One is, how do you form yourself as a professional? How do you, how do you, I, I'm talking to a lot of students. I know Ginny is as well. We're talking to students that are just getting ready to graduate. And, and you know, uh, there, there's a lot of fear about what's the next step. So that's one territory. And the other territory is, what about these institutions? Some of us are from USC. How do we deal with these big institutions Haven definitely will have things to say about this, mm -hmm. to try to introduce um, into this very highly bureaucratic structured environment, to introduce these small changes, to introduce these ethical ways of behaving. And I'd like to know, just maybe a show of hands, which, which kind of territory do you want to cover? Any questions you have? Rachel says, infiltrate from the inside. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What do you, what, where are you infiltrating? So it looks like Rachel and Haven both have an infiltration methodology. <laughs> I was saying that uh, Megan can infiltrate from the inside of MoMA. That's what you, that's your vote? That's one strategy. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Revoting? <laughs> are we voting where to put her? Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. But what, what kind of strategies do you, uh, Rachel, do you employ or what have you sort of gathered from what she said that you might take into your own employment situation? 
Well, I'm an artist, so, you know, the role of an artist in um, our community or it, the role of a white middle-aged woman artist uh, right now, or what my, what my, um, how do I, how do I use my position to elevate other people's voices is a, a, something I'm thinking a lot about. And so I've also been thinking about these black spaces and these keepers of black spaces and these, these, these spaces that are um, keepers of the objects that black people and people of color make. And so I thank you, Megan, for your stewardship of the underground museum <clears throat> for those five years. And that's just a question. These and Haven, what, what were you, you were sort of nodding vigorously in agreement and you're now in the hot seat of a Dean's position uh, at USC. How, are, how, how do you think about these institutional shifts? Well, I really appreciate what Megan said in the be beginning of her talk, you know, about um, understanding, you know, that oftentimes you're putting your own personal um, aspirations, right? Ambitions aside for the greater good and, um, and obviously, you know, this isn't my first encounter with a large entity. USC is a, you know, it's, it's a fairly large uh, university, but I also, you know, at times have worked in corporate America. And it's, there's something about walking into the belly of the beast and understanding it and not just standing on the sidelines and, you know, making commentary to know that you can actually incite a lot of change when you are part of the system and keeping the door open for others uh, to come in behind you. I, I think that's really important, so. It's, it's hard, you, you do sometimes have to put aside, you know, the complaining, you, you go home and you do it, but you know, at the same time- I'd I love to hear the two of you talk about that because yeah. both of yeah. you have both had very high level corporate commercial experience and you've also chosen and gone into the arts. And you're also both part of, inst not, not at the moment, Megan, but you've been part of institutions that you had a radical impact on. Yeah. I mean, one thing I would say too about the like doing something for the greater good, it's not, you know, it doesn't even have to be completely altruistic all the time too, because the thing about doing something for the greater good is that we are all also part of the greater good. And so when you put, you know, a contribution into that pot, you will receive back yourself, right? And that what you're doing again is like basically creating a new kind of operation and a new kind of system for us all to operate within. And then I guess the only other thing I would say about this kind of distinction of, of, of scale within institutions and, and what's possible and, and how to infiltrate and not infiltrate and how to you know, work around the bureaucracy is also thinking through um, scale of impact. You know, I think that at the Underground Museum, because we also were a small institution that you know, it, we never needed to have the blockbuster, right? That wasn't what was important to us. What was important was like the quality of the work the quality of the exhibition, the quality of the relationship, the quality of the speaker, right? And if, you know, 200 people saw it, great. We also had talks that were equally important and had incredibly like lasting impact that had 25 people there, you know? And, and it really was about, again, you know, knowing that um, the 25 people that walk out of this room received a transformative experience, right? That they are leaving the underground museum with a new kind of information or a new kind of an idea or a new kind of context that they didn't have when they walked into the space, right? And, and, and understanding and this kind of ties into this idea of the greater good is that then you can hopefully daisy chain ideas and aspirations and inspirations outward because those 25 people go and talk to 25 more people, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is how we, um, communicate with one another and are in relationship with one another. And I think it's, it's understanding that, that that initial bud can be what takes an idea very, very far, um, but that you might not know, you know. Response, Haven? Yeah, I mean, you know, I agree with so much of what she said. Actually, even uh, the fact that you're in this moment of time where you've walked away from something, you know, I've only done that once in my career. It was incredibly frightening because I think um, I'm a planner. I like to kind of know, you know, what the, the landscape looks like. But that also being said, that was probably one of the most important moments in my career to kind of leave, you know, something that at the time, you know, leaving corporate America, which I understood pretty well, but also feeling a certain amount of frustration about like, you know, was I really doing as much good as I thought that, that I was doing? 
and I'm a pretty big believer in like in you know uh, individual personal responsibility for things. I'm I'm always saying this: if you have if you don't think you have any power, you do have power as a consumer of nothing else, right? But um, now in retrospect, understanding, you know, I, I needed to do that for myself. You, you, you probably reached a, a similar place, right? When you decide to do something. And it was really in the long run, I'm probably much older than you are. <laughs> and Suzanne, you can probably relate to this, but you know, you have these critical moments in your life and your career where you really are tasked to what do you really truly believe in? And when, when you make a stand like that, again, like I said, it, it does, it, it it's, incredibly, I think, cathartic to do something like that in, w within your life. But at the same time, you know, it was a defining moment for me. Mm -hmm. So um, all that being said, you know, uh, I think that not just what you've been doing, but what you continue to do, again, it's, it's keeping that door open for other people. Because I, I don't know about you, but how many times someone has come to me after, you know, a talk or something and said, you know, I really feel that way too. And it's actually surprising because you don't feel that way when you're standing in front of the room, kind of exposing yourself and, and talking about what your value systems are. But it's so important for people, you know, especially I think women, right? To stand yeah. up and, and do this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear from anybody else that has a thought, a question, something that's been uh, stirred up around this conversation, this sort of very complicated multi-layered conversation anybody raise your hand uh jenny wants to say something yeah i mean i would love for us to give uh, any students uh, yeah any, but, any anybody else hi. just to kind of get a sense of who else is out there let's see we've got valencia we've got reed we've got margo we've got yiz and valencia and i have talked a lot about uh, so many things that you thank you for that that was an amazing talk uh megan and, and suzanne but I, I'll just speak for Valencia or, or with, we, I can prompt you on, but we just had this conversation recently about if it's possible to like make change from within the institution. And I kind of gave her the um, advice that it wasn't in really big institutions. And then I've actually been thinking about it Valencia since. And I feel like, oh my God, I gave her bad advice. Like you can make these changes. And I think you're bringing that up again, uh, Megan, but I, I wonder if we can talk more about like what even those small things like you're saying that can really have lasting change might look like. Yeah, let's hear from Valencia. You want to pop in here too? Um, yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, <laughs> um, no, you know, you know, I was reading because I had brought it up. I was reading Barack Obama's book, A Promised Land, and he had mentioned how his mom had said, you know if you really want to make change, you know, you go into the institution because she has been working out, she was working outside of the institution for so long. Um, and so I was just like, you know, I think the, at the core of the question is just like, as a change agent, like how do you show up to the fight in these institutions? Like what type of impact do we need to be making? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it runs across the board. I can tell you, you know, I, so I was, the director, right? So uh, it's not just a creative position. It's also an administrative position. It's about how do you form the systems and structures that support all of the activities that happen in the museum. And one of the things I actually did that, um, that I'm really proud of is that I brought childcare to the museum so that the parents who are working at the museum could be active participants in the work and be present, right? And I, that came actually out of a meeting that I was having with a lot of other museum administrators. And we were talking about particularly a women's place in the museum, right? And they were complaining that, you know, so many times women have to make like these very distinguished um, uh, uh, directions like do I choose a family or do I choose a career because there's just not an available uh, resource for them to have both within their place of employment and everybody was talking about oh I can't do it oh it'll never happen in my institution it'll never it'll never it'll never it'll never and like seriously I just went back to work the next day and started researching who can support childcare. Who can we find to fund childcare? And while it's not an art related conversation and it's not related to like the kind of idea of how do you change the, the curatorial direction of a museum, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's an example of how you create the conditions in which more people have the availability and possibility to work at an institution because there are all of these other pieces of their life that are being considered. And so you're opening up the door even wider to say, okay, 
and parents, you know, so that people don't have to distinguish their personal life and their professional life so much, right? And also, you know, I think on the creative level, again, it's really just about thinking through and just having very clear, honest conversations. Who's being shown? What's there? You know, and, and again, really leaning very, very deeply into the, the fact that it is people that are sitting in a room with you making a decision, you know? So I think the how is to like look around and say like, who, who, is in, who is in the room? How are we working? What needs to happen that's, you know, um, not happening yet, you know, from a curatorial, from an administration and, and then figure out how to get towards that North Star of, of where you all want to go together. You know, I think that the, it's really, and again, you know, Jenny, I think um, it's, it's not bad advice. It's probably real advice, you know, in the sense of like, what do you want to see, you know, how, you know, to Suzanne's point of like being patient or not patient, like, you know, what are you willing to like take on and, and, and see or not see, you know? Um, but I think that uh, if, for me, at least in that particular instance with the underground and for me working, you know, over the last five years, I wanted to create the workplace that I wanted to be in, you know, and so I did the work to find out how to create the systems that I wanted to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think particularly relevant to this issue of child care would be Reed, who has a question. <laughs> And if you need to go exactly at one, this might go on for up to five minutes after, just to let you know. We are two minutes till one now. So read about me really quickly that question. I'm we fine. You have two minutes to talk. No, you, let's talk, Reed. Let's talk. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you all for being here and thank you all for creating this forum. Um, I, I know many of your faces and I'm so happy to see you all again. And for me, as a mom, as an artist, as an educator now, um, I'm very busy and I love having these opportunities to kind of have a, a space and access for these kind of conversations and dialogue that I think are so very important. And I think whether it's in the museum space or whether it's in the academia, I think we should you know, continue this obviously with like what's going on with uh, COVID and everything. and. Um, so thank you all for that. Thank you all for your presence. Thank you, um, Megan, for being here. Um, I didn't know your whole provenance <laughs> was so extensive and amazing, and I'm so inspired by it. Um, I'm curious to see where you will go next, and if you are staying within uh, the museum sphere or the art sphere in that sense. Um, I'm just kind of curious of the current climate, you know, like, we, we talk about like, like, it's great that we've created childcare spaces, but like, what does it look like in the next six months? What does it look like in the next year? Like, what are these museum spaces? And also thinking about, like, it could be these kind of forums of conversation, like creating more of these forums of conversation and dialogue. It could be creating, like, I'm thinking about my students that don't have access to travel, that like some of them have never traveled, you know, and like, having them being able to have accessibility obviously to art and like i'm just curious like you know with with your knowledge of like where what have you experienced in the last year i'm curious about where the arts are kind of positioning themselves to navigate through this reed uh, wants to know what's happening next like yeah. we are. <laughs> this Sorry. Is the last comment megan so if you want to go ahead well, in Los Angeles, it's very tough right now. Obviously, museums have been closed since March and have no track to open anytime soon, unfortunately, because of city policies, which um, since we're being recorded and it's gonna be on YouTube, I will not speak towards. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things one of the things that I have been interested in, and I mentioned it in terms of like why I went to USC and why I was interested in public art and what I actually think we were doing very well at the Underground Museum and what I would like to continue to do from within the institution and, and from whatever project I'm working on next is how do we like kind of shake ourselves loose of the building itself, you know? And how do we actually start to understand that the building is not the end all be all of where art can happen, you know? That there is 
um, there again, and this kind of goes back to this idea of what would a museum and how would an institution um, be and behave if it were a citizen of its city, right? Where else would it do its work? Where else would it find community? Where else would it find space to create? And, and where would it find creativity? You know, like where would it find its art? And I think that, um, you know, as we are, it's almost like the inverse of as we are all stuck inside in many ways, how are we actually thinking outside the building of the museum? And I actually think that um, moving forward, you know, even when we can return to the buildings that we need to really like, you know, get out of the architecture and not see the architecture as this bounding box for where we do our work, because it's just not the only available place. And that is again to how, I mean, to think about the underground museum, what it was doing was it was working to bring artwork out of museum collections and into relationship with people. Now it did so obviously in the context of a building, but we also had a block party. We also had a garden in the back. We also, you know, had all of these spaces that were you know not attached to the building itself where we did our work and I think that that's a really important way to think about the future of where we can house all of the creative activities we want to do um, if the building is not available to us if we can't get in the building and I guess I mean that not just from a pandemic perspective but from an opportunity perspective from a gendered perspective from a race and ethnic perspective if we can't get in the building then we need to get out of the building and we need to go somewhere else. Okay, I think that's an excellent, excellent uh, piece of information to end on. And thank you, Megan, you've been pretty phenomenal. I know you're phenomenal, but you've been even more phenomenal. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. Good to see you all. And for the people, I know Aurora, but I can't see Tamara and Ralph, but nice to see you guys too. And thank you all for being here on your lunch hour. And, um, and, um, Dean Haven, Lynn Kirk, thank you so much for uh, hosting this series. We really appreciate it. Chance it was my connect. pleasure. This was lovely. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Megan, for joining us. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Suzanne.